call names. Can't have. Now listen, you the right of Stop calling me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names. I'll you in your goddamn get... face, and let's... you'll stay plastered. <laughs> Would you call God material or immaterial? Immaterial. What is something that's immaterial? Something not extended in space. Can you give me an example of anything other than God that's immaterial? Lost logic. This educational system is going to fail you. Well, I graduated from college believing exactly as you believe. Yeah, here we go, uh, 40 Ounce Hemlock, this is episode 22, and drop the beat. Alright, alright, alright. Man, I'm so excited. I really want to, um, I really want to get right back into what we ended on, and then make the transition that was promised. Uh, I'm so happy that you're here, this is the second part of our third series. We've got two 10-part series behind us about five weeks in, and I'm just really excited. I'm really excited to be doing this, and like I said last time, I just want to do it better each time. So with that, um, I'm trying. Come on. (laughs) I'm trying. I'm learning. Sometimes I listen, and I'm like, come on, dude. (laughs) Um, See? You get little peeks behind the curtain. Uh, Like Dignan says, I'm, I'm not always as confident as I look. Anyway, we want to get right to it, and I want to just remind you I'm not going to do the rehash thing. Man, if you missed the last episode, I really need you to go back and start. You're one episode off at the beginning of the series. There's no excuse, okay? Just stop right now. Here, I'll give you a moment. I'll stop talking for a second. Just push pause. And then after that, go back to the previous episode. Ready? Go. All right. Now that they're gone, um, I want to go right back to this note from the very end of last show. Because I said there was a general observation that I wanted to make about those verses, about those lyrics that we looked at. But then I, also, I said I also wanted to look at two particular lines of, or a couple lines of the lyrics themselves, and we didn't really get to that. So I just want to touch on that real fast. Because late night, Jack's been holding forth at local bars, equivocating between Marx and Rosa Parks. Oh, I'd love to spend some time on that, but I'm going to pass over here for a second. Here's the next line. Everywhere that Jack looks... He sees deception. Everywhere there's excellence, Jack sees oppression. He starts suspecting that he's the only one with reflection and then uses this to justify his own lack of direction. All right, so let's back up. Everywhere that Jack looks, he sees deception. Everywhere there's excellence, Jack sees oppression. I bring this up in the context of wanting to talk about, first of all, just the the, the sort of personal psychological account of how radicalism comes about or makes its appearance, makes its appeal to a particular person's mind, but also in terms of the intersection or the, the the point of agreement, the point of overlap between the theoretical account and the personal account. Um, and this lyric touches both. Remember we said that whether he realized it or not, before when Jack held this, you know, this body of religious beliefs, you know, however consciously, um, when he held this body of beliefs, whether he realized it or not, uh, he had the framework for, you know, within the system of belief, he had the framework for interpreting and understanding and assimilating um, his own judgments and the coherence and the rationality of his own judgments about good and evil, good and bad, about morality. Um, because he has a, his theory has something to say about what human goodness is, what it looks like, you know, what, it, what the account of it is, what it means, and what human badness is, and what it looks like, and where it comes from, its origin, you know, its point. Um, he had an account of both of these. So, so within this framework, when he himself finds himself recognizing goodness and badness in the world around him, he feels coherent. Because he doesn't have, you know, to go all the way back to... Uh, from Dar- Darwin to Donald Trump, and again in, in the Charlie Gard series, he doesn't have this problem where one, a belief at one level um, is left hanging in the air unsupported because the, the foundational beliefs that, that ought to go beneath it, in, in, in levels beneath it, don't exist. He doesn't have this problem. He doesn't appear to. He has, a, he has a consistent set of beliefs. But now in the story, going back to the general observation, we see that this sort of abandonment of these this body of religious views preceded this 
sort of uh, adventure of hypercriticism that Jack finds himself on suddenly. He's, he's disabused himself of this framework. He's dropped the religious beliefs, um, perhaps purposely, perhaps you know, inadvertently, perhaps consciously, perhaps un- unconsciously. But now there's a problem because, of course, Jack still wants to, and as, as a person in the world, he has to be able to, we all have to be able to, make judgments of right and wrong, good and bad, but what he's going to find, if he were, you know, reflective about it, what he's going to find is that now, well, what underpins those judgments? What on his new view of the world, and Jack's not even super conscious that he, yet that he has a new view of the world. He thinks he's just subtracted something from his view. He's not conscious yet that perhaps he has also added something to it. Perhaps he's about to add something to it because what is it that underpins those judgments now? What is his framework, his moral framework for making sense of his own feelings about right and wrong? What do they mean in this new world that he's beginning to posit that doesn't have these, these religious truths that he formerly believed in it? You know, everybody, and I don't want to make too broad assumptions about when this happens for people, you know, especially, especially because it, it probably happened late for me, and I don't want to throw myself up on the graph on the chart next to all of you and embarrass myself, but... A person just does come to that point. Most people come to that point, it, you probably in adolescence as, as it transitions into young adulthood, where they begin to look around the world, their view sort of expands. You know, the, the, their, their immediate concerns are, are, are still their immediate concerns, but they begin to look beyond their immediate world um, that, that adolescence sort of comprises. And they sort of look around the world. And as you begin to do this, you obviously get a taste or a sample of all the goodness and the badness in the world. You know, um, speaking of head trips, Jack's been at the library too. Now watch very closely how the theme carries through. He's been reading about all the pain in the world, wondering how a good God could let it all unfurl. Like maybe it's all a world. Maybe there's no God at all. Or maybe I'm God, said Jack, and there was no fall. As for the so-called jealous and omnipotent creator, if he's there, he better be a damn good debater. All right? His view of the world is expanding, and this happens for a lot of people, and I think it happens for a lot of people at a very similar time, but when it happens it is, is not important here. The point is that now Jack's looking at the world, and when he, as his view expands, as he begins to take in you know, history and society and, and all these things and look around the world, he doesn't have this religious framework underneath him anymore to make sense of his intuitive judgments about what he sees out there in history and present that is good what he sees out there that is bad, what he sees out there that is right, what he sees out there that is wrong. But he still needs to make the judgments. We all do. He's reflexively. Can't help but do it, right? So he needs some new account. He needs some new story to tell about his own feelings about, not just his own feelings about, but about the origin, the actual status, the the, the, the actual metaphysical, ontological makeup of rightness and wrongness. So now there's sort of a gap forming, and and he's probably beginning to notice it at some level, a gap forming in Jack's view, and something has got to rush in to the void. Jack's got to bring unity, like we said last time, to his view. Knowledge is the search for unity, because when you come to know something, you come to know the relation between two sorts of what you formerly thought were disparate things or categories of things, and you begin to understand how they relate, if they relate. And so to understand how two things or two categories of things relate is to understand what unifies them. Well, Jack now has got to bring unity to his view of moral badness and moral goodness. He doesn't have it anymore. Now, like I said last episode, we're going to come back to this point after we touch on the more theoretical stuff. Um, But we can sort of notice here what is beginning to take the place for Jack. Everywhere that Jack looks, he sees deception. Everywhere there's excellence, Jack sees oppression. He starts suspecting that he's the only one with reflection. Like, he's the only one who can see this. He's got this special knowledge. He begins to look around the world around him. And like we said last, last episode, with the evil, with the badness, with the moral badness, what are you going to do with it? you got a couple choices. Either it's real or it's not. Okay, if it's real, next choice, where does it lie? The most fundamental distinction here is it's either internal to man or it's external to man. All right? Now, if you move in the direction of it being external to man, like we said last time, this was sort of a subsidiary point, but you open up the field 
to endless tinkering and experimentation with human society. And you also open up the field to leaders, politicians, who play upon your sense of dissatisfaction with the structures around you because you believe that those structures either constitute or contribute to the badness you see in the world, they begin to play upon your dissatisfaction and use it for their own purposes. There's a great passage in Ameritopia um, where uh, Levin uh, captures this. He says, uh, well, he calls these politicians, he calls these leaders that, that, that do this, that find those who are dispossessed or disaffected or disillusioned and, and, and play upon their desires and play upon their... Um, their detachment. He says, uh, he calls them utopians. He says, utopians f also find a receptive audience among the society's disenchanted, disaffected, and dissatisfied and maladjusted who are unwilling or unable to assume responsibility for their own real or perceived conditions, but instead blame their surroundings. And he starts suspecting he's the only one with reflection and uses this to justify his own lack of direction. Anyways, here, here's the rest of the Levin quote. He goes on. He says, they blame their surroundings or the system or others. They're lured by the false hopes and promises of utopian transformation. And they're lured by the criticisms of the existing society to which their connection is tentative or non-existent. Jack's sort of a loner, isn't he? He got left, didn't he? And now he's sort of a loner. Anyways, Le Levin goes on. He says, Improving the malcontents lot becomes linked to the utopian cause. All right? So this is how, I mean, when you see politicians like this, like, for instance, uh, like, like a Bernie Sanders or, or, well, to go back to what was the previous president, I'm not going to mention his name, not out of any animus, just because I don't, the guy seems to have so many names um, over the course of his life. I, I, I get a little bit confused, so I'll just say the previous president. Um, you see this with the way they made their appeal to their base, right? The appeal always comes with some sort of like, like broad, broad uh, attack or insinuation that some structural element of society is hopelessly, you know, undermined and corrupt, and it's got to be torn down. The appeal comes: help me tear this down so that we can build something right and good, you know, in its place. But the message is always destructive. Tear down, tear down, tear down. I mean, look, go, we're, what did he say? We're, we're days away from, we're fundamentally altering this country. Well, you, to alter something's fundamentals is to alter its, its essence, what makes it what it is. It is to change its nature. The whole thing has got to go. It's got to be scrapped radicalism it's got to be torn down radical root torn up from the root radicalism and, and by the way we're going to look at some writings from the, the the intellectual if you want to call it that the intellectual heritage of that person i just referred to the former president you know with the guy with so many names um and you're going to see this in spades you're going to see these themes and i also just want to say here at the top just as a, as a, a hint about where we're going what if it turns out by the way, what if it turns out that this view that Jack is finding himself increasingly inclined towards, this radicalism, what if it has all the same relevant features as the sort of religious view that Jack has disabused himself of? What if it turns out that in the end he just swaps one religious view for another but doesn't realize that? Oh, that's interesting. Anyways, we'll come back to it. But like I said, I'm gonna, we're going to point to some of the writings from some of these people, and you're going to see these themes. Anyways, we're going to get to it. I promise I won't rhyme anymore. Um, but there's something we got to do first, okay, before we get to those writings. And that's what I promised for this show, which is to talk about the theoretical end of this. We said radicalism, what's the personal, sort of the, a, an example of a personal account, which we just got. But what about the theoretical account? Well, that's what we're going to do now. All right, well, that is not a wrap-up of the personal half. Um, there's something more to say about it, so just hold on to that for a minute, okay? We will come back to it, but I do want to get into this theoretical end because we sort of have to do these next to each other, um, and it's going to pay off. It is going to pay off, okay? So 
I really think it, it, you know, as much as I didn't like the coin flip, I think it helped that we started there. But now we gotta look at this, all right? And to do it, wait, what's this again? This is the theoretical half. We're talking about radicalism. And I wanted to give a sort of account, just one of many, right? A sort of account psychologically of how the view comes about. I know that was a real broad outline. There's more to say about it. But I also want to give a sort of analysis or sort of exposition of what it looks like theoretically. I know that sounds so trite. Just bear with me. This is actually really interesting. And it's very simple. Isn't that, isn't that great? Oh my gosh, that's great. I hate complicated stuff. This is actually very simple. So to, to illustrate it, I'm going to use a really simple illustration. In fact, so simple, it's, it's silly. Um, actually, I'm going to borrow an example. And because we got, I don't know, 14 minutes here, I'm going to ham it up a little bit. Okay, so there's there's a perp, there's a purpose to this, and so I'm just going to say here at the top, if if at any point over the the, the the remainder of the show, if you suddenly question yourself, like wait, did I just jump episodes, or is this still the Antifa series? Yes, it is. So just remember that I said that. Um, yes, it is. But we got to make a little departure here in order to come to come back and see where we're standing, you know, properly. So I'm going to ask you to switch gears with me, with me for a moment here, okay? Because this is going to seem, like I said, it's going to seem a little bit like, wait, what? Um, I want you to just consider with me a little thought experiment, a little illustration, whatever you want to call it. We're going to imagine that I'm, uh, oh, I don't know. Well, I do. I say, I don't know. Of course I know. Of course I know what I'm going to say here. Um, but it is ridiculous. And so I, I sort of hesitate a little bit. Uh, you know, there's all these, all these, this proliferation of soft, what you might call soft academic disciplines in the universities these days, studies, everything studies, this studies, that studies. Um, and so in that grand tradition, um, I am, uh, let's just imagine I'm about to get my, my doctoral degree in um, historical anthropology of sports, organized athletics or something. I don't know. Um, just go with it, okay? There's a point here, but you got to bear with me. So we're imagining that's me, that's who I am. Let's say I've, uh, I've, been, I've been publishing chapters here and there for my dissertation prior to you know, releasing the full thing. And it's, there's, all, there's all sorts of buzz about it. You know, I'm like the hot item. Um, as the academics say, I'm, I'm the sexy new thing. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> I can't actually. Um, now, everybody's talking about my work. You know, what can I say? It's just so brilliant. Um, and I'm going around to all the big schools, small, you know, prestigious, you know, smaller liberal arts colleges and stuff. And I'm giving talks, you know, on my uh, area of expertise. And it just so happens that I come to your town and, you know, you're in the supermarket one day, <laughs> right? And on the bulletin board, you see the, the talk advertised. So you're like, oh, you know, I'll be cultured. I'll be cool. I'll go check this out. You know, I like sports. <laughs> I know some anthropology majors or, you know, I, I, I almost majored in anthropology, whatever. So here we are. It's that night, you know, Wednesday night. Campus is all about, I'm just, campus is not all a buzz. You know, in some, in some secluded corner of the campus, you know, the, of, the, of the, the buildings where, you know, the school hosts visiting uh, speakers and such. We're assembled in a, you know, a lecture hall or something or like a, a room in the union or something. The lights in the audience are low and I'm, Lights on, there's lights on the stage, podium, glass of water, all that stuff. There I am, you know, and I'm just concluding my talk. For I've spared you the talk, all right? Um, I'm just concluding my talk. By the way, here was the thesis of the talk. Are you ready? The thesis was this. And it, Sorry, let me just stop here. Yes, you're in the right place. Yes, we're still talking about Antifa. Okay, there, now let's get back to it. Um, so I've just concluded my talk, and which incidentally was about the following thesis. My thesis was that all of the best basketball players who have ever lived are from Norway. Got it? Okay, good. That's my thesis. So now it's the end, it's the end of the talk, and I've just concluded. I take a sip of water, you know, and I, and I say from the podium, I say, are there any questions? You know, and of course, in, there's aisles, you know, in, in the audience, and there's some mics, microphones that have been set up in the aisles. You know, and you're about, I don't know, 10, 20 feet from one of these microphones, and you're like, yeah, what do I do here? Um, I do have a question, actually, but, I, you know, I'm not such – so heavily invested in this that I'm going to necessarily get up in it. Maybe I'll just sit here for a moment and listen to some of the other questions and then decide on that basis whether to ask my question or not. And you feel pretty safe in this because you feel like um, the question on your mind has got to be the question on the forefront of everyone's mind, right? 
And so some time goes on. So people ask questions, you know, the evening's wearing on and no one asks your question. And you're like, wait a second. You know, you, you really were going to think nothing of it. You were sure it would come up, but it didn't. And now you're kind of like, okay, really? So, you know, with a sort of exasperated sigh of resignation, you amble up to the microphone and, you know, tap, tap, tap. Is this thing right? It's gone. Okay. No feedback. Um, and you're cordial, you know, hi, good evening. You know, thanks for, thanks for the talk. Enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to ask my question. You say, um, to me, you know, on stage, I don't know why I've made me the guy, but here I am, here we are halfway in. So, um, you say, I, I'm almost embarrassed to ask this because surely, well, I'll just ask it. Um, but I, I don't mean any offense by it. You say, uh, where in the, in the course of your talk, uh, did you actually give the some evidence for I, I take it to be your your primary thesis that all the best basketball players who've ever lived are from Norway. And you realize you've sort of you know crescendoed on the end of that and accentuated, right? And you sort of like recoil a little bit, didn't you? You don't mean to be pointed, but it's like this was supposed to be a talk, you know, defending this thesis, and you didn't hear any evidence for the thesis. In fact, on its face the thesis seems a well a little bit absurd all right so you've asked your question and you're you're actually blushing a little bit you feel a little bit self get like we you know i i I do this you know want to make sure you came across right and you're not sure if if you overlooked something and you're kind of like okay how was this received and you're you're looking around you like people have got to be thinking the same thing as me right and the room is kind of silent it's kind of a little bit awkward and so i i I pause a moment i say um well, maybe you came in late, I say. Uh, but 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 that's fine. I know some people were, were making their way in. Um, let me just let me just reiterate the point from the talk. I say, the point was that I have this thesis that says that all the best basketball players are from Norway, and so that's the thesis I'm defending here tonight. Thank you. And you say you had actually begun to back away from the microphone, thinking, "Oh, I can sort of move back to my seat now and not be a distraction." As he's answering. And you stop short in the aisle and you're like, you look around at, at the people who are seating, you know, seated by where you're standing. You're like, is, it, is this me? <laughs> right? And you come back to the microphone and you say, well, I, th- thank you for your response. Maybe I wasn't clear. What, what, I, what I meant to ask was where, give me, help me reconsider, if I missed it the first time, a specific piece of evidence for the claim that all the best basketball players are from Norway. And there's, a, there's another sort of pause here, right? And you're like, come on, people, right? I'm not, am I alone here? And, and I, I, come, I sort of lean into the podium. Ah, I say, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I understand now. And you're like, Whew, okay, he, he understands what I'm saying. It's just been a misunderstanding. And I say, uh, from the podium, I say, um, here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you evidence. Uh, and, and this is, sorry if I didn't, I didn't emphasize this enough in the talk. I, I meant to emphasize the following point. I have this thesis, and it's that all the best basketball players are from Norway. Do you see? <laughs> do, you, do you see? Do you follow? Um, so, and you're like, all right. Now now you're looking around for cameras pointed at you, right? Like, this is, is this happening? Is this real life? And and someone unconsciously, you, you actually just let slip under your breath. You say, uh, no one believes that you say to yourself sort of muffled no one believes that right and i'm like and fortunately i jump in here and this is almost you're almost glad you did let it slip although it was a little bit revealing um because i jump in and you're like okay now he's gonna he's gonna fix this right i say here let me let me let me help let me clarify this let me clarify um this is a give and take how about we work with some examples could you give me a member you know someone who you consider one of the best basketball players who's ever lived. I say to you, and, and you're there like, is this, this seems kind of, you know, pedantic, right? <laughs> um, because how hard is this? Uh, Michael Jordan, you say, you know, <clears throat> and you're realizing as you say it, you know, you're not holding out a lot of hope for what's, gonna, what's, what's coming here. You say, Michael Jordan, <laughs> right? And I say, ah, yes, um, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan is from Norway. And you say, I, I had a feeling you were going to say that, <laughs> right? Now, look, we can keep on with this, right? Um, and, and, and maybe you wouldn't have 
maybe it would have taken you a few examples or me a few examples or anybody a few examples before they sort of realized what was going on here. But the point is, right, at a certain point, you're going to say, hold on a moment. You know, you're going to stop running through lists of basketball players and you're going to see that whatever name you bring to the game is going to be irrelevant. It's going to be subsumed within the thesis because I have this thesis that says that all the best basketball players are from Norway. And you're going to wise up and you're going to say, uh, look, I don't mean to be, you know, maybe I misunderstood the purpose of the talk, but I think that you're mistaking the kind of claim that you're making, or I am, but I think you are, you say from the audience. You seem to just be giving a claim telling us how you define your words. I thought that you were going to be defending the statement and giving evidence, particular evidence, for the claim that all the best basketball players are from Norway. That's quite a different thing, right? The one kind of statement tells me something true and interesting and unknown, priorly unknown about the world. The other statement is just a statement about how you define your words. So if I just keep bringing basketball players to you and say they're Norwegian according to my thesis, that's just, that just means my thesis is I shall declare that Norwegian and best basketball player mean the same thing. It has nothing to do with whether any of them actually are. You're getting really worked up now. You, know, you realize that you've, you've been yelling. <laughs> now look, okay, I'll stop, I'll stop, I'll stop. Look, you might be thinking, yes, 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 this is, this is the Antifa episode. Let me just stop you again. This is the Antifa episode. If you get what's going on here, and we'll, we're going to say one more word about it at the top of the next show. We'll clarify it real quick. But if you get what's going on here, you are going to understand something about radicalism that is profoundly important to understand. All right? So come back at the top of the next show. We'll do this again at the top, and uh, we'll pick up with this, and then we'll move on, and we're going interesting places. Uh, my name is Nick. It's the 40 Ounce Hemlock Podcast, and thanks for joining us. <laughs>